Oh hey look, it's Joe Scott, that other YouTuber that also talks about stuff I talk about. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. He's actually pretty cool. Anyway, recently he made this video that you can find in the description with a somewhat direct title. The absolute worst climate change solution possible. And you can sort of see the solution right here in the thumbnail, slowing down the earth. And just to spoil his video in case you're not going to be watching it, he basically explains that it's not a good idea and what would happen to earth if we did slow it down. The effects would probably be quite the opposite. And then I suddenly realized, wait a second, I've been actually collecting a lot of these strange unusual ideas and explanations on what we can do scientifically to prevent climate change for basically several years now. And in just the last few months, there actually have been two other propositions that kind of take the cake for being even maybe a little bit crazier. At least when it comes to the question of, let's solve the climate change by doing something absolutely ridiculous. And so in this video, basically let's explore these crazy propositions that, I guess scientifically, do make sense, but also really don't. They really do not make much sense at all. Usually for one simple reason. Even though they might lower the temperature of the planet by like 1 degree or 2 degrees, they'll actually end up destroying the planet in a completely different way. And so without further ado, let's start with the first one. Now this one is probably not the worst, and you might have heard of this one before, but essentially it would involve similar components to what we usually find in volcanoes. Here we're talking about things like sulfur dioxide. With the proposition being really simple, can we basically just spray it somewhere in the upper atmosphere using a lot of different airplanes, thus producing similar effects to what we usually expect from a typical volcanic eruption? which generally does lead to a slight decrease in temperature, mostly because of the effects of sulfur dioxide, as it essentially blocks some of the sunlight, preventing it from reaching the surface and from warming up the planet. And there's of course at least one startup that already is trying to do that as well. Make sunsets. It's actually two dudes trying to launch a bunch of balloons filled with sulfur dioxide to have it delivered into the upper atmosphere. And the thing is, a few years back, similar ideas or potential experiments have been actually banned in countries like Sweden, and so this startup unofficially, or technically illegally, conducted their experiment in Mexico, which led to Mexico banning future experiments of similar type. And so basically here, most governments, and technically most scientists, don't really want to try this because we don't really know what it's going to lead to. Obviously it might lower the temperatures a little bit, but at the same time, sulfur dioxide also destroys ozone. So yeah, it's quite a big trade-off. Also, as far as I know, that's basically the premise of Snowpiercer. Their icy world was created because of similar experiments. And as far as I remember, people actually become cannibals in this movie. I don't want that. I don't want to eat anyone. So yeah, launching balloons or airplanes releasing sulfur dioxide, maybe not the smartest idea. But similarly, there have been other propositions of maybe just increasing the amounts of clouds. Clouds are white, they basically reflect some of the light, and increase the total albedo of the planet, thus cooling down things in the process. And cloud seeding, or weather modification, is something that's been used for decades now, and is definitely actively used in a lot of different countries. There's an older video in the description that describes a lot of this in detail. The problem is that, here, if we use things like airplanes, we would need a huge amount of airplanes, pretty much flying every day, trying to produce clouds in certain regions. And ironically, just by flying those airplanes, we're dramatically increasing the overall emissions from those airplanes, possibly even counteracting the effects from the clouds. Now alternatively, it's possible to use maybe ships, which actually has been proposed by several studies, with at least one study from the Royal Society, suggesting we can produce these specialized ships that could basically produce clouds simply by swimming around, but in this case we would still need at least a thousand of these, they would have to be active at all times, and at the same time because they would be evaporating a lot of water, here, the effects are once again somewhat difficult to predict. All of this evaporated water is also once again a relatively potent greenhouse gas, so we don't really know if those ships are going to produce clouds or just more vapor. I mean, it's definitely not the worst idea, but yeah, not the best either. But here's an idea that's a little bit cheaper and also possibly even not that bad. Using plankton. Plankton is actually a huge carbon sink on planet Earth, and as these tiny organisms replicate, they often absorb huge amounts of carbon. Some of them also produce huge amounts of oxygen. And so by using things like, for example, pumps, it might be possible to encourage the growth of plankton by basically pushing huge amounts of nutrient-rich waters into much colder depths of the ocean in order to mix the water and in order to encourage plankton growth. And interestingly, 
these extremely large blooms of algae and plankton usually happen after major volcanic eruptions. Here's one after Tonga. This is like hundreds of kilometers in size. And so creating something like this artificially has a chance of dramatically reducing carbon levels by turning it into actual little creatures. But obviously this is not without problems either, because some of this bloom has a tendency to be toxic to other life. And at the same time, by encouraging growth in certain biomes, it might completely destroy the ecosystem. So here the long-term effects are completely unknown. Ok, this kind of an experiment would be kind of interesting to try on a much smaller scale, just to see what happens, but I would definitely not use this on a planetary scale in order to try to reduce the temperatures. Here's actually another, somewhat unusual proposition. Arctic Ice Project. The point here is to spread tiny glass beads that you see right here on top of the surface of ice across the entire Arctic. And if you are asking why, I mean the answer is pretty obvious, right? Uh, wait, hold on, what is the answer? Oh yeah, that's right, it's to make things more reflective. It's to create more albedo. Less sunlight absorbed, less ice melted. By having ice absorb less sunlight, we expect it to melt less. And according to the website, it's actually already being tested somewhere in Norway. Ok, ok, cool, I guess we'll see how that goes. Although somehow, I'm not sure if putting tiny tiny pieces of glass across the entire Arctic is going to do wonders for other life. I mean, we already have microplastics pretty much everywhere, now we're also going to have microglass beads. So not entirely sure where all of this goes just yet, but I guess we're going to find out in the next few years. But all of these previous ideas were kind of on the older side. A lot of them have been talked about for months or even years, and as I mentioned, some of them have already started their initial experiments. But in the last few months we also got these two somewhat brand new ideas that I also wanted to talk about because, yeah, we probably shouldn't do those either. Ok, the first one is kind of intriguing, but intriguing for different reasons. It's based on a concept known as space sunshade or sunshield, a somewhat old geoengineering idea that basically suggests we can change the temperature of the planet by either amplifying or reducing the amount of sunlight by placing an object in one of the Lagrange points, specifically L1, located between Earth and the Sun, the point that is usually used for various solar telescopes, and by then essentially having something either create a sunshade, reducing the total sunlight, or amplifying sunlight in certain locations. But the previous problem with this proposition was that, well first of all this particular shade has to be really large, and second of all, the pressure from the sun itself at some point might completely dislodge this sunshield, making it somewhat impractical because it's not going to stay in a stable orbit for a very long time. The solar pressure is powerful enough to actually nudge certain objects by quite a large amount, within just a few years. But this brand new paper from July of 2023 potentially solves that issue, introducing a tethered asteroid. Basically a sun shield attached to an asteroid that acts as a kind of a counterweight. Ok, honestly this one kind of made me giggle. It looks like a little potato flying a kite. And I guess in theory this could maybe work to some extent. So basically here we have our sun shield that would block some of the sunlight, reducing the overall temperature on the planet. And because it would be attached to a relatively massive asteroid, the solar pressure in this case would not have as much effect, but it would still have some effect. As a matter of fact, the Yarkovsky effect that usually pushes asteroids around is powerful enough to change the orbits of asteroids after a few years. It's actually the reason why we usually cannot predict the exact orbits of various asteroids for longer than a few hundred years. And so even here after some time, this whole thing is still going to be moved by the pressure from the sun. It's probably going to take longer than just the solar sail itself, but it will definitely happen, thus reducing the effectiveness of the entire process. On top of this, this might happen. And that is not something we would like to happen. Also moving an asteroid in a different orbit is definitely beyond our current abilities. The DART mission that was successful in 2022 nudged a much smaller asteroid by a tiny tiny bit. In order to move a larger object from for example the asteroid belt into the L1 Lagrange point, we would definitely require some super advanced rocketry that we currently do not have. Lastly, in order to even make a big enough sunshade, we still have to have an object that's probably going to be at least 3 million tons in mass. And so unless this is produced in outer space, placing this in orbit would be extraordinarily difficult. It's approximately as massive as 500,000 James Webb Space Telescopes. And that's of course not including the cables, which would also be required for all of this to work. So yeah, 
cool proposition, definitely a cool picture, but the kite flying potato is probably also not going to work either. And then we come to the final winner, the best idea, I mean the worst idea, although once again the idea that's based on clever science. But before I talk about it, I wanted to briefly mention actual scientific paper that was recently released that uncovered unusual color changes on the entire planet. The oceans on the planet seem to be also changing in color as a result of climatic conditions. Now things are basically turning a little bit more green and possibly a little bit more turquoise, although here I guess I'm oversimplifying things. The color though is definitely changing. And what's intriguing here is that we know that the color of the planet affects how much heat it receives. It basically affects what's known as the albedo. You can learn about this in the description below. Now more albedo it means more reflectivity. Based on this particular study, we're not entirely sure how the oceans are changing yet, or basically we don't really know the exact albedo changes, but there might be a chance that the oceans are going to be a little bit more reflective, not less reflective. Anyway, these are definitely interesting discoveries and definitely good science. Most of these changes are a result of phytoplankton, which increases the overall amounts of chlorophyll. And intriguingly, approximately 56% of all oceans changed color. But can we maybe artificially change color of the planet in order to obviously increase albedo? Huh, what a good idea, right? Yeah, maybe not. Well, at least one study that you can find in the description makes a proposition about that as well. And I mean, this is a really big if, but just bear with me here. What if we paint the planet white? And I wish I was kidding, but this is a legit proposition with actual calculations and science behind it. And to some extent, it's actually based on the recent discovery of the whitest paint ever produced. It's able to reflect approximately 98% of light. Okay, so if we take that and then basically spread it in certain regions of the planet, in theory, it will make the planet reflect more light. It will definitely increase the albedo. In practice, though, we basically are talking about covering approximately 1% of surface, or the entire Sahara Desert, or I guess parts of Australia, in this super super white paint. Rough calculation suggests that we need approximately 140 billion gallons, or about 200,000 Olympic swimming pools. In other words, you would need a lot of paint. And yeah, obviously someone will have to do it as well. Here it actually reminded me of that famous scene from Spaceballs when they're combing the desert. And so yeah, theoretically, we could use the super white paint to paint the planet white, making it a little bit more reflective, and thus reducing the overall temperature on the planet just enough to mitigate current climate problems. But on the other hand, by doing a quick napkin calculation of the actual production costs of all of this paint, it becomes obvious that even producing this paint would be ridiculously expensive, would involve insufficient dyes and insufficient materials, and would very likely affect the climate negatively in many different ways. For example, there's only like several million tons of titanium dioxide produced annually, and that's what's usually used in a lot of white paint. Trying to figure out how to make billions of tons of this would be somewhat challenging. And more expensive, more advanced paints would obviously require even more. And so painting the planet white is, in my book, probably the uh, silliest idea of them all. At least in terms of human engineering ideas. But you might also want to check out that video by Joe Scott just to see his take on this as well. Anyway, at least for now, well, that's kind of all I wanted to mention. I've been actually collecting these studies and sort of writing down these ideas for several years now, and we finally got to discuss some of them, at least to some extent. Now honestly, when it comes to climate change, the opinions here are obviously divided, and it is quite a political topic, but I don't think it's an issue we're going to solve anytime soon, and definitely not by building these humongous projects that might actually end up crashing on us, and in our existence in a completely different way. So yeah, let's not rush into things. Let's not launch any more balloons, and how about we just kind of stop with these crazy propositions, uh, at least for a few years. I am sure there's going to be a better solution. Anyway, on that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.